sometimes just plain stupidity. Humans, we're a, we're a mess, and, um, and yet God loves us. It's, uh, it really is amazing grace. You know, when we read this short section, I know Shell's going to expound on it, but um, when, he, when he texted me last night, I read it for a few minutes, and then this morning, and it's always amazing when we look at it, but we see God's mercy and his grace and his wrath played out in this brief reading. Um, the contrast begins in chapter 18, really, with Abraham, a spiritual man, uh, praying and asking God to spare the wicked Sodom. And, and, um, and he begins to barter and go, if there's just 50, if there's 45, and it becomes an auction, 40, 30, 20, 10, you know, and it just goes on and on. And Scripture tells us that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, and indeed it, it does. But in, in this reading, it is a, a, a contrast between uh, a spiritual and worldly. Uh, and, and one of these follow-up Scripture is in, in 2 Peter 2, 7, where it says, uh, rescued righteous lot. I don't know how many of y'all read that and went, What? you got to be kidding me. You know, is, is Lot really righteous? But you know what? I'm not God. God is God. And Abraham, um, Abraham followed God into uh, a new land, and Lot followed Abraham. He wasn't much of a leader himself. He was more of a follower. And when he got off and away from Abraham, he fell back into sin, and he fell into the ways maybe not the ways because it does say that he um he resented the the perverse sexuality there in Sodom but he was definitely not um being guided by the spirit so Genesis chapter 19 verse 1 two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom and when Lot saw them he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go your way. And they said, no, we'll spend the night in the town square. And he pressed them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered the house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house, and they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. And Lot went out to the men at the entrance and shut the door behind him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and you do in them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge, for now deal worsely with them. And they pressed hard against the man Lot, and they drew near to break down the door. And the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house both small and great so they wore themselves out groping for the door then the men said to lot have you anyone else here son-in-laws sons daughters or anyone within the city bring them out of this place for we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against the people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out, and he said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Go up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But it seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. As morning dawned, the angel urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of this city. But he lingered, so the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, and the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside of the city. And as they were brought out to them, 
One said, escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to them, Oh, no, my lords. Behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life, but I cannot, cannot escape to the hills, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. It is not a little one. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. And he said to them, Behold, I grant you this favor also, that I will not overflow the city which you have spoken of. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city is called Zor, or Little. So we see in this scripture just God's mercy. We see his wrath. It is an amazing, amazing piece of scripture. And again, when we read the Old Testament, sometimes we read it and we go, does it really say that? And it does. Regrettably, as human beings, we are messed up. Thank goodness for a Savior in Jesus Christ. We all need Jesus, period. Let us pray. Almighty God, I just thank you for this day that we can come and worship. I thank you that we can raise our voices and sing praises to you. You are worthy, Almighty God, worthy of praise and glory and dominion forever and ever and always. God, your goodness is immense, and I just thank you for your word. From Genesis to Revelations, everything is pointing us to our Savior, Jesus. Lord, help us not to be blinded by worldliness. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Wade. So I asked you at the beginning of the service, who was the one person in Scripture that Christ tells us to remember? Did anybody know? Lot's wife. Isn't that fascinating? The Lord tells us to remember one person. We don't know her name. There's very little mentioned about her. She's mentioned three times in the Old Testament and just once in the New Testament when Christ said, remember Lot's wife. So if you're turning your Bible first to Luke chapter 17, I want us to begin where Christ told us why we should remember Lot's wife. Then we'll go back to Genesis 19 and have a much better understanding of why we are to remember Lot's wife. So in Luke chapter 17, we'll read verses 26 through 33. And Jesus is actually teaching on and preaching on his second coming. Luke chapter 17, verses 26 through 33. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of the city of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in his house, let him not come down and take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his own life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this privilege again to be here with you. And I do pray that all that we hear and all that I say this morning will glorify you and make much of you. In your holy name we pray, amen. So when we think about Lot's wife, I think about who I would have, you know, of course I'm not Christ, but who would I have wanted, thought that Christ would have said, remember, why not Abraham, uh, father of the faith, so to speak. How about Moses? Moses was the prince of Egypt, and he rejected the ways of Egypt to go and live among the Hebrew slaves and lead them out of slavery. Or, or David a man after God's own heart. Then I found out it was a woman. I thought, oh, it's got to be Sarah. I mean, she's the first woman listed, listed in the hall of faith in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. 
not Rachel, not Rahab, Lot's wife. I remember the first time I was uh, asked that question, I was actually in Kenya. Anthony Matheny asked the question, and I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty thought-provoking. So I always wanted to really just reach in deep into the Scripture and understand why Christ would tell us, the only person he would tell us to remember is Lot's wife. So before we can really understand who Lot's wife is, we need to understand who Lot is, right? Because he's her namesake. He, he's the only one who, who gives her identity in the Scripture. So we want to step back and we want to look at, at Lot. And of course, as Wade mentioned, he was Abraham's nephew. So we got to look at Abraham a little bit too. We, we're not going to read all the passages. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 12. If you want to turn there, I'm not going to identify everything that we're going to look at. I'm just going to kind of bring you up to speed with a little history background of Lot and who he was. Now, if you remember, Abraham was living in the land of Haran. Abraham was probably a moon worshiper. We don't know that for sure, but that's kind of where that area looks like according to, to history that, that he was more of a moon worshiper. And, and Christ, or the Lord God, just comes and invades his life and, and grabs a hold of him so much so that Abraham takes his word by faith and moves his entire family to a new place. He moves them to the land of Shechem. And there, of course, Lot, his nephew, is with him. Lot's father had already died. So Lot goes with his uncle Abraham and, and Abraham and all that they had. They leave and they go to the area of Shechem. Now, this is the first time Abraham builds an altar when he gets to Shechem. It's interesting to know this is the first time that God is worshipped in the promised land. Abraham builds an altar and they worship, of course, Lot and all the rest of the family is there. And, and, then, and then later he moves to Bethel. And we know where that is. That's Bethlehem. And that's about seven miles away from Jerusalem. And so he builds another altar. And it says, and Abraham began to call on the name of the Lord. He began to call on the name of the Lord. And then they leave and they go to Egypt for a little bit. And then they come back. And he rebuilds the altar there in Bethel. And it says again, and Abraham began to call on the name of the Lord. That is very important to understand because that in Hebrew means that Abraham was growing in his knowledge and understanding of God. So it wasn't that he's just worshiping here and he's going for a little while and he's worshiping and he's going for a little. No, he is actually growing in his relationship with God. So Lot would have been a part of this. Lot would have been there when they're worshiping. He would have seen these remarkable changes in his uncle's life. And somewhere along the line, Lot comes to saving faith. We don't know exactly when, but we do know, as Wade pointed out, that he, according to Peter in chapter 2, is a just and righteous man. And then Abraham even says in chapter 18 that he is a righteous man. So Abraham is growing spiritually. Lot is experiencing this, this growth. And it also says that Abraham is very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. And we also see, as we read in the Scripture, that, that Lot is growing too. Not necessarily spiritually, but he's getting more and more wealth. It is important that we understand that Lot would have been around a very godly influence. Now, we do not know for sure when Lot marries Mrs. Lot. But somewhere along the line, this is where they are believed to have gotten married. Most believe that she was either a, an Egyptian or a Canaanite. She could have been from the city of Sodom where, where they were working and living in that area that Noah happened to, I mean, uh, Noah, um, Lot happened to meet her and they got married. We don't know for sure. But the reason she's probably not mentioned by name is because she was not a believer. So that's why we know she does not have a name. That's kind of typical in Old Testament history. But at some point in time, she comes and is a part of the family. But as we see Lot and, and his wealth growing, and we see Abraham and his wealth growing, and their herds are growing so much, there, there becomes a dispute between Abraham's shepherds and Lot's shepherds. So they have to work out this problem. And if you'll turn in your Bibles, I'm going to read this section to you because it is important that we grasp what takes place in this. This is in Genesis chapter 13, and I'll read for you verses 8 through 13. 
Genesis 13, 8 through 13. Then Abraham said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. It is not the whole, is not the whole land before you. Separate yourself from me. I do want you to understand this word separate, it's not as clear as it is. It's, what it means in the Hebrew is, hey, our, our herds are so big, we, they, uh, they're crossbreeding, they're, they're doing, we need to separate our herds, we need to separate our herdsmen. Abraham is by no means saying, Lot, get out of my life. Uh, that's not what he's saying. He's just saying we need to, to separate our business in a sense. So let's keep reading. If you go to the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and he saw the Jordan Valley was well watered. Everywhere the garden was like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zorah. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus, he separate, thus they separated from each other. Abraham settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved or pitched his tent toward Sodom. Verse 13 is very important. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and great sinners against the Lord. There's a lot of food for thought there in that passage. So Abraham gives Lot first choice. Now when we begin to kind of get an understanding of the kind of man Lot is. You would think that if your uncle had been so kind as to, in a sense, father you, to take you under his wing and protect you and teach you business and, and teach you the ways of life and not leave you in a, in a land, that you, you would probably think, well, no, no, Uncle Abraham, why don't, why don't you take? You just tell me where I should go. You tell me what I should do. It makes us wonder if Lot had already kind of thought through where he was going because he knew this problem was arising and there was going to have to be a place of separation but we see that Lot chooses what is best. And he did not care so much that it was by a wicked and evil city. And, and he doesn't just move in the, the vicinity of it. He moves down amongst the cities. There's five cities, and they're all five very wicked. We only named the ones Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah and then Zorah. But they're all very wicked. But I... But, but Lot, he just moves right there among them. We see that he chose based on sight and not by faith. He, he looks at the well-watered plains, and he thinks, wow, my herds are already increasing. And maybe I should move there. My herds will increase even more, and I'll gain more wealth. I'm not so worried about being so close to the sin city. Maybe he and Mrs. Lot, maybe they have a conversation. Maybe Miss Lot was from the city, and she begins to share with him, you know, city life is much better than this tent living. All the conveniences, we won't have to travel to and fro so far to go get what we need. Oh, it's much easier, Lot, if we live there. And, and this, this God that Uncle Abraham is worshiping, he's, this, this is a little too much. You know, he's building altars and making sacrifices and and, and you know what, Lot? He's the only one we know who worships this God, Yahweh. Maybe, maybe we should just move down and come back and forth, and we can just kind of do the church thing with Uncle Abraham on the weekends. Look, we, we need to, to build our own life. We need to separate from Uncle Abraham and go and do our own thing. He's, he's just a little caught up in this God thing. But what we recognize is that Lot, Lot is a self-centered man. He's a selfish man. He's thinking what's best for him. He's not thinking about what's best for his family. He's not really thinking about what's best for the future and, and growing in Christ. And so we begin to see the first glimpse of complacency in Lot's life. And as we go through it, we'll see that Lot is nothing less than a complacent man. People who are complacent, they always walk by sight. They do not walk by faith. We cannot draw near to God when we're living in and amongst the world and living like the world. But, you know, God is always gracious to us. You know, we, we, we've probably all been in a place where we slipped off into a little sin and God comes and he, in a sense, he rescues us or he, he brings a, a stern warning to us. And that's what he did with Lot. Uh, when Lot w there was living in the land of Sodom, there was a war that broke out. 
and this is in Genesis 14, there were four kings on the other side of the mountain range, and, and they came over the mountain range, and they invaded, and they fought against the five kings of the Sodom area, and they defeated them. And, and they took captive, and they took the gold and the silver and the animals and all the stock, and they took it back home with them. Well, somebody came and told Uncle Abraham. Uncle Abraham wasn't too pleased with what happened to his little nephew. I think sometimes when we think about Abraham, we just think about this old man sitting under a tree at the front of his tent with an old staff, and he's just a shepherd man. Abraham was a man's man. Don't, don't think anything less of Uncle Abraham. He was a man's man, and he was a God-fearing man, and he was a man who called on the name of the Lord. The Bible says that he, he rallied up 318 of his trained men. Think about that. He had his own private army. And he had three friends that lived in the vicinity of him, and he went to them, and he said, hey, this is what's happened. And they all put their troops together, and they go, and they fight against the four kings that had just defeated the five kings, and Abraham defeats them. He is somewhere in his mid-80s, by the way, when he's fighting. He's not a young buck anymore. But Abraham, he goes, and he, and he rescues Lot. And I can't but, but help to think that that Lot would have spent some time with Uncle Abraham. And I cannot help to understand from Scripture the man that Abraham was, that he would not have pleaded with Lot. Don't, you don't want to go back. Why do you want to live in that sin-sick city? Lot, are you growing in your relationship with Christ? Do, do you, or, or is your wife? Are you children? But, but not Lot. He just... He cannot go back to the tent living. He needs to be back in the city. He and his wife, they talk about, you know, the, the city life is much easier. They, they want to be there in the city where there's so many opportunities for Lot. You know, it's just, there's so many things for the children to do. They can get involved in all kind of sports. They, they can go and they can sing in all kind of choirs. It's got the best schools. Who wants to live out here in this wilderness living? Who wants to live in a tent? When we can live in a mansion and a big home. And, and remember, look, Lot, you remember how our business was growing and, and things were going so well for us. We can go back. Our home's probably not destroyed completely. We can do a little work and everything will be like it was. And it'll be the easy, complacent living that we've been doing in the past. So we see that Lot and his wife, they go back. It's just been a slow drift for, for Lot. He's he just easing away more and more and more from God. Maybe there's been a time in your life where, where you have, like Lot, drifted away from the Lord. And, and, and you got involved in a little bit of sin, and, and it got a little bit more and a little bit more. And, and maybe God sent a friend to warn you that you were living a complacent Christian life. And you're, you were, we hadn't seen you at church lately. And, you know, you used to come to Sunday school every Sunday, but now we, we, we don't ever see you at Sunday school. We, we want you to be a part. You know, church, church is just too, too much, kind of like living around Uncle Abraham. I don't, I, don't, I don't need that much church. You know, maybe you don't read your Bible like you used to, or maybe you're not praying like you used to. I can't go to prayer meeting before Sunday school. That's ridiculous. I'm already up there for two and a half hours. Why, why do I need to be at prayer meeting? And on Wednesday nights, they expect me to pray on Wednesday nights. It's not an expectation. It's a get to. You get to go to church. You get to come to Sunday school. You get to come and pray with brothers and sisters in Christ. You get to fellowship with Christians. See, if we're not careful, we, we act a lot like Lot. We just slowly drift away, and we begin to do our own thing and, 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 and really just decide, you know, this, is, this, this life is for me. I like the verse in 1 Timothy. It says this, but people who long to be rich, this is talking about being rich in the worldly things and, and anything other than God. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and they are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires. They plunge then into ruin and destruction. You see, when we begin to drift, we don't, we don't go out drifting slowly with the intention, I'm going to be way out here. It's just like people when they get married, they, they make all the wonderful wedding vows and they talk about this life and this covenant and they'll never separate. But then one day after the next, down the road when things get a little tough, tough there's a slow drift. There's a slow separation more and more, and then the next thing they're divorced. 
Well, see, it's, it's very similar to that in our life with Christ. If, if we're not careful and we're not guarded, we begin to drift away from Christ and we get complacent and we begin to live in sin. But I do want you to remember this. Christ is more anxious to forgive us than we are to ask. Christ is more anxious to forgive us than we are to ask. When we find ourselves in, those, in these places of sin where we've drifted away from the Lord, and, and then there is a little bit of conviction. A lot of times we, we justify it or we, we let bleed the lies of the devil. And he's like, you don't, you don't want to go back. You're just going to feel shame. You're going to feel bad. You don't, you don't No, It's not what Christ says. He anxiously awaits to forgive us. So we don't want to put off tomorrow what we know we need to do today. We need to run to Christ. And then we look again in the Bible and we see Lot. He considers all these things with Uncle Abraham, and they decide to move back into the city. But this time, he gets serious about living in the city because the next time we find Lot in the city, he is sitting at the city gate. He has really arrived in the leadership of the city of Sodom. And he is a, he is a statesman of, of sorts. He is respected by all these wicked Sodomite sinners. They think a lot alike. Oh, he's got a good opinion. Yeah, he deserves a seat at the gate. He is accepted now. He, how do we as Christians, men and women of God, how do we get into a place where we desire the acceptance of worldly people? It's because we continue to drift and we begin to live that complacent life. Lot had actually just become a friend to the world. We need to be careful when we choose our friends when lot moved back you know he began to make all the right connections he wasn't so worried about connecting with men and women of god he was more concerned about success in the world you, if you notice when when christ when we read in in luke chapter 17 when christ listed what they were doing in noah's day and what they were doing in sodom's day and in the day of lot there's not one thing he mentioned that was sinful he didn't talk about the sodomites. He didn't talk about the drunkenness. He didn't talk about all the things we know was going on. So what he was telling us in that passage there in Luke is just the busy worldly living is enough to separate us from Christ. But we good Christian folks, we don't think we can get there until one day we wake up and we are there. And if we're not careful and we're not guarded, and we're not actually living among Christians and seeking Christ and calling on the name of the Lord, that's where we end up in a very complacent life apart from Christ. Did you know this? Statistically speaking, we are the average of our five closest friends who we spend time with. It's a business lesson taught. I remember reading it when I was in school that your five closest friends are going to be your greatest influence, and they are really going to shape you. And, and if you look at it, it's very obvious. Think about who your five closest friends are. They probably enjoy the same things you do. Uh, men who love golf and hanging out all the time and love sports, they tend to congregate with those kind of men. Men who love to, to, to hunt and to fish, they tend to congregate with those kind of, kind of people. But what we learn from this statistic about choosing our friends is we need to choose them carefully. If, if we choose friends, I remember it wasn't long after I was saved. It was the first man who actually discipled me. I was in a room of about 30 men, and we all went around and introduced ourselves. It was a Christian weekend. And I remember I was probably one of the youngest ones there. I, re I remember looking at individual men, and there were two or three men with baseball hats on. One of them had a jersey. And I remember thinking in my mind, those are the guys that are like me. One of them had a hunting shirt on. I said, these are the guys I'm going to try to make connections with because they were like me. The one guy who I became best friends with, with was one of the last ones I would have picked. And he ended up mentoring me for about four or five years. And the Lord greatly used him in my life to shape me into being more after Christ. And one of the things he told me, and I've never forgot that, he said, Shell, if we're not careful, we choose friends based on what we want and who we like, and the things we like. He said, let me encourage you. Always choose friends who are going to stir you for Christ. 
and pray and ask God to put those kind of men in your life. And he was the last one I would have chosen. And out of all the men in my life, he's one of the top five God has used to move me along in my faith. So we want to be careful who we choose as our friends. In fact, Proverbs warns us that he who walks with the wise will be wise, but the friend of fools will suffer harm. Lot did not choose his friends very wisely, and we've talked a lot about Lot to try to figure out who his wife is. So now we're going to stop, and we're going to look at Lot's wife to to figure out who she is because the Bible just doesn't tell us that much about her. So let's remember Lot's wife. Who is Lot's wife? Now what we want to do is look at all the opportunities Lot's wife had to know Christ. If you heard as Wade read, what happened to Lot's wife? She died and was turned into a pillar of salt. She went to hell. She did not inherit eternal life. So we know she's not a believer. Another reason we know that she's not named in Scripture. But she had the great privilege and so many opportunities to know Christ. She had the opportunity to live around Abraham and his wife, Sarah. Could could you imagine, ladies, being able to sit with Sarah? And just to talk and, and, and to understand, how, how is it that you've come out? What, is, what does it mean? What, is, what have you seen in, 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 in Abraham's life as he's growing? We see things, but what do you see? Because you're more intimately connected with him. She had that opportunity. She also had the opportunity to worship the one true God. No doubt when at some point in time when, when they were at the altar and they were worshiping God, she would have been there many times. She also had... The opportunity to witness the power of God when God sent Abraham and that small band of soldiers to rescue and defeat four kings. She also knew the covenant that God had made with Abraham. She had entertained angels in her house, as we read in Genesis chapter 19. She had sat and dined with them. She had held the hands of angels who led her out of the city. And even in some way, she would have witnessed the righteous behavior of her husband. And and this is challenging for us because it does say in 2 Peter that he was vexed by the sin. It doesn't necessarily mean that he was preaching against it because he's not known as a preacher of righteousness, but it did bother him, and it helps us understand that he never partook of that sin, though he was very complacent. And then also she had the opportunity to run with the angels as they led them out of the city. She came so close to salvation, but she never calls on the name of the Lord like Uncle Abraham had. She never called on the name of the Lord like her own husband had. Sadly, she will be one of the ones, or already is one of the ones, who heard the words of Christ when he says, depart from me, I never knew you. So who is Lot's wife? She is a great example of someone who faithfully attends church. That's who Lot's wife is. She's a church member in some some degrees. She, She would have been one of the ones who maybe sang in the choir, but never committed her life to Christ. She she might have even been baptized. She might have had her name on the roll. But she never really committed to Christ. She just never could separate herself from the world. And we see how Lot struggled with that. And she obviously struggled with it because she wouldn't come out and separate herself, even though she had the opportunities to. Now, let's go back to that night when when we read in Genesis chapter 19, when the angels came and and they had supper there. And and it had to be a very, I just want to give her some credit where credit's due. It had to be a very exasperating night for Mrs. Lot. You know, there's a meal, and it's the busyness of preparing uh, the meal and, and getting it ready and entertaining the guest. And, and then all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door, and all the men of the city, it says, from every corner, young and old, they came to Lot's door. And then she realizes, what, what are all these men doing here? Well, they, they want to bring the angels out so they can rape them. So, so Lot, he slips out to bargain with them. And again, we see the ignorance and foolishness of complacent living. He says, hey, I got two virgin daughters. Take them. Rape them. Do what you want with them. Do whatever you want with my two girls. But don't touch these two guys. 
Then all of a sudden, they do not like that. They said, who are you to bargain with us, Lot? We'll do to you worse than we were going to do to them. And by the power of God, the angels stick their hands outside the door, and they rescue him, and they smite him with blindness. But these guys are so lost in their heathen sexuality that they, they are still groping for the door. They still, even though something has happened and they lost their sight, they are so rich in their sin, they are still trying to get to Lot and these two men just to rape them. What a wicked place that Lot lives. Yes, it was an exasper exasperating night because th then that they, they find out, hey, we're, we're not here just for dinner. We've come to destroy the city. Can you imagine Mrs. Lot at this point? Family. Now, we see that she had two daughters, but if you read Scripture carefully, it, it indicates that it could have been sons, and it could have been son-in-laws, and maybe other daughters. We don't know for sure, but it is very possible depending on how you interpret the text. So, of course, she... She sends Lot, you've got to go. The angels send him too, but you know, she's right there with him. Oh, yes, you've got to go. Go, go find every one of them. We've got to get out of the city. She believes the angels are going to destroy the city, so much so that, that Lot leaves too. And, they, and Lot's running around the city, and he's imploring his family members to come, come out. Now, can you imagine the devastation on her face when Lot returns empty-handed? Not a single child. All are going to perish. All are going to die. In fact, the Bible says that they just laughed at old Lot. You see what it does to your witness when we live a complacent life for Christ? All of a sudden, you, you need to share somebody with something, and you know the truth, and you know you need to tell them about Christ, and, and your heart is overwhelmed for their salvation. But because of your complacent lifestyle, your witness is void. There's, there's no power in your words. There's no there's no power in your life. And they just laugh at him. You want to know who a man is? You want to know who a woman is? Ask their children. No one knows them better than their children. We see Lot's children laughed at him. What a poor, complacent life. Had no impact on them. Could not even stir them to leave the city and believe him that it was fixing or about to be destroyed. They mocked him as a fool. No respect. Yes, that was a very devastating moment when Lot returns, empty-handed. But now, there's no, there, there, there's no time to rest because dawn is coming. That's what the scripture says. As soon as Lot, Lot got back, then, then the sun started coming up. Look in your Bibles at Genesis 19. I do want to read a few more verses with you. Wade's already read these, but we're going to look at them again. And we're going to read verses 15 through 17. As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But old Lot, he lingered. He just stood there. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, and, and the Lord being merciful to him, they brought them out and set him outside of the city. And as they brought them out, one said, Escape with your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. Here's old complacent Lot. Now he's lingering. What am I going to do? All these riches, all these things that we have, how can we flee? I, I do believe the angels. I, I do believe. But do I really want to give all these things up? What's Miss Lot? I just wonder, what is she saying? Lot, do we need to go? Lot, do we need to stay? And, and they just linger. Lot lingers. He knew the city was going to be destroyed. He knew that they had said there was an outcry of sin. And he knew the dangers. And he believed them because he ran and warned his family. The angels stand before foolish old Lot, pleading with him. But he lingered. How many of you have lingered so long in the sin you didn't know how to get out of it? 
I've, I've had the privilege at times to, to share Christ with people. And, and there are many times that, that you find people and they are they're so deeply entrenched in their sin. They just, they just can't turn it loose. Thank you for sharing, Shell. Maybe, maybe, maybe next year. I've literally had people tell me, right now I'm just too busy. Right now, I'm, I've, I've got to get these things done. I'm so busy at work, i got so many opportunities. When, when I get here, then, then I'm going then, then to start going to church and start doing the right things. But again, we have two different people we're talking about here. We're talking about Lot, who is a complacent Christian, and we have Lot's wife, who is lost. We, we don't want to linger in sin we want to run and turn and we don't want to get caught living for the world living the lie living in our secret little darling sins that we think nobody else knows and in everybody else's eyes we look like good old people but but we just lost in sin you know and you, you're you may be sitting there right now and you're thinking of the sin that you're lost in you thinking of areas you have grown complacent in I, I, that's not because of what i'm saying because i'm not identifying any sins that's the work of God. So if you have those stirrings in your heart, don't, don't let them linger. Don't sit there and coddle your sin. Hold on to it like nobody else knows. doesn't matter if anybody else knows. God knows. We can't fool God. He knows the inner workings of everything about us. Complacent Christians, they tend to linger in their sin. James 4.4 4 says, You adulterous people. Now, when, when James says this, He's comparing it to a husband and wife who have a rich relationship and one of them has stepped out and has committed sexual sin with someone else outside of the marriage. So what he's saying is, hey, you, don't you have a covenant with God? How in the world can you go and start sleeping with the world? That's, that's the thoughts behind James and what he's saying here when he says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship that's how we like to label it. I'm just, I'm just friends with, with this. It's, it's just a little sin. It's not that big a deal. Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy to God. See, there's no inner peace when we're living in our sin. We, we just keep rationalizing and we, we keep making excuses for it and we keep justifying it. Well, so-and-so does this and so-and-so don't do this and and I'm a pretty good person, so we justify our lives, and we continue in our sin, and we continue to hold on to it. Well, let's go back to the, to the, to the morning, so the, the sun's dawning. C can you imagine being there? Just, just put yourself in, in an old concrete home in a city with cobblestone roads, and, and, and the angels are standing there, and, and they're pleading with them, we got to go. And finally, the angels just stop. It says, by the mercy of God. They just stop pleading, and they grab each one of them by the hand. Two daughters, Lot and his wife, and they lead them out the city. You're, you're, you're running down the, the streets, and, and the angels are just about dragging you out of this city. And you, and you see all your friends' homes. You, you may even see the baker who's up early to get the fires going. And, and, and you're going toward the gate, and then there's a special place. There's, there's Lot's seat. And he takes them outside, and he sets them, and he, and he says... Flee. Flee to the cave. Flee to the hills, actually, is what he says. But here's Lot again, as we read in the scriptures. I, I, can't, I can't do that. I can't go live in the mountains. That, cave, that, that tent living, that was tough. Do you really expect me, Lot, to go and live in a cave? No, I can't go live in a cave. How about this city of Zor? It's just a small this is what he meant. It's just a small, sinful place because that was one of the cities the angels came to destroy. Lot bargains for a city, a place of sin to go and dwell again. It's just a little city, just a little sin. And that's what we find ourselves doing. It's just a little sin. My wife does not know I'm looking at porn. My husband does not know I'm having chats with my old boyfriend in high school. It's just a little sin. It's okay. It's not going to cost me anything. So we see the bargain pays off for a lot. He gets to go 
to the city of Zor. Now, when, when you leave the, the hills are this way, the city of Zor is this way through the same valley. And, and so they, they take off, and they finally are on their way, and they're leaving, and they're going to the city of Zor. Lot and the two daughters are ahead, but Lot's wife, at some point in time, she begins to fall behind. She can't keep pace with Lot. She doesn't want to keep pace with Lot. Maybe she's thinking about all the things that she's leaving. Her home, her wealth, her status. I don't want to go to the city of Zor. I don't know anybody there. That's a strange place. All my money's back here. All my fine dresses, all my fine shoes are back here. I, I don't. She begins to slow down more and more and more until she stops. And the Bible says she looked back. In the Hebrew, that means she turned to return to her life of sin. She said no to God. That would have been her opportunity to act in faith and take the word of God and believe and go. But she does not. She turns back. So close to salvation. She was almost there. The, the angels led her out the gate. They pointed to eternity and said, go, flee for Christ. But no, she couldn't do it. She was almost saved. She had a true understanding. She'd heard it many, 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 many times. She knew the gospel. But she stopped just short. She, she could see her husband and two daughters at the gate of Zor, according to Scripture. And as she sees them entering in, she stops and she turns back. What a tragic life. So close to salvation, so many times hearing the word of God, so many times hearing the gospel, only to reject it. That's why Jesus tells us to remember Lot's wife. Sometimes, good old church attenders, they, they spend more time trying to widen the path of the narrow way so that they can be accepted in according to their terms. Sometimes they just refuse the faith. They just refuse to walk with Christ. They refuse to give up all the riches of the world. And unfortunately, they hear the words that the Lord said. They, they, and then, then they go to the Lord, you know, and they stand before him in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. It says, you know, they, they've spent so much time in church. They've heard the gospel. They know, Have you ever witnessed somebody that's got all the right answers, but their life is absolutely fruitless? They have no fruit in Christ. You know they're not saved. There's no real truth there. They're never in church. But they can give you every right answer. That's how Lot's wife was. She, she, she probably was like the rest of those that the Lord was talking about in Matthew when the Lord said, Then I'll say to you, depart from me. But before that, he, they will say to him, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not perform many miracles in your name? And he says to them, depart from me, for I never knew you. You, you can't go part way and be saved. That's, you know, that's, that's what her problem was. She was almost there. She got so close to salvation. The Bible says that Christ does not desire for any man to die, but that all should have eternal life. That's why we remember Lot's wife. But what do we need to remember about Lot? I do believe that's a twofold message, by the way, when the Lord said, remember Lot's wife. I do think the emphasis is on Lot's wife, but I think there's a smaller emphasis on Lot as well. What, what kind of fruit do we see in a, in a complacent Christian's life? Have you read the rest of the story? You know what happened to Lot? Well, he ended up going to Zor for just a little bit, but for some reason he had to flee Zor. And he ends up in a cave with his two daughters. His two daughters decide, hey, we got to have children. We, we got to carry on our family line. So they get their father drunk. And they sleep with him. And both of them become pregnant. And you know what Lot's fruit is? Two sons that fathered the nations of the Amorites and the Moabites. For the most part, all of those nations for all of history have been nothing but Pagans and against God. Who, who wants to name the name of Christ and have that kind of fruit in your life? 
What's the point of salvation if you don't want to know Christ? John chapter 17 verse 3 says, This is eternal life, that you know me, that you know Christ. Why, why do we get caught up in this worldly living and in the sports and the activities and the shopping and the success of business and, and everybody will look at me? Why don't we get caught up in the Word of God? Living and being men and women of God. I've kept talking to you about the tent. That's what we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to set our roots down like Lot did in the city. We're tent dwellers. We're sojourners. Our home is not here. Our home is in heaven. We need to live like our home is in heaven. We need to live like today is our last day. We need to be sharing the gospel with people. We need to make sure people know Christ. We've talked about three people this morning. One is Abraham. When you think about Abraham, ask yourself, are you calling on the name of the Lord? Are you growing in your relationship with Christ? Are you excited about knowing him? Do you get up in the morning with the excitement that you get to read the word of God and you get to spend time with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Think about Abraham, think about that. Or are you like Lot? You look at yourself and you see you just kind of drifted away. You've let so much sin get in, por- in, in, in part of your life that you you just caught up in it. You're still saved. And, and I don't want to be too hard on old Lot. I'd be much harder on us because Lot didn't have the Holy Spirit living in him. I, oh, <laughs> Lot did not have a copy of the Word of God. We do. So are you like Lot? You like Abraham? Or are you, lot, lot, are, you, are you like Lot's wife? You just don't know Christ. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you truly know the Lord? Are you 100% today that if you died, that you would spend eternity in heaven? If you are not 100%, you can be. 80% ain't going to get you there. Lot's wife was probably 98% there. But she didn't make it. She turned back. So, as you think about those three people, I just want to ask you to bow your heads. And we're going to play through a song, or Danielle's going to play through a song. And then when she's finished, I'll close us in prayer. But I do want you to take the opportunity before we get out and get back in the busyness of life and think. Who are you emulate, emulating? You living like Abraham? You living like Lot? Or are you living like Lot's wife? So if you'll bow your heads and just take a moment to, to pray. Father, we do thank you for the gift of your word. And I do pray, Lord, that that there is anyone here that doesn't truly know you, just like the hymn Danielle was playing, Lord, that, that we would know we can just come to you just as we are, that we will lay our life before you and that they would repent and turn to you. Lord, please, please don't leave us in complacency. Your word is a stern warning, just like you sent to Lot when he was beginning his complacent living. 
Lord, help us to know that we cannot mingle with the world and live for you as Christians. Help us to live 100% and call on the name of the Lord like Abraham did. Lord, help us to be men and women that honor you and live for you every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.